Welcome to the third talk on trustworthiness, reliability and material science for aircraft structure. My name is Andrew Ang and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and their elders past and present who are the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne's Australian campuses are located in Melbourne's east and outer east. Please now allow me to introduce our speaker for today. Mr. Laurie Smolland, AM. With over 250 publications in the technical area of aircraft structural integrity, structural mechanics, fatigue testing, and advanced composite bonded repairs, Mr. Laurie Smolland is a qualified aircraft accident investigator. Laurie has been seconded to both the former Australian Civil Aviation Department and the U.S. NAF Air Structures in Washington, D.C. as an airworthiness engineer. He is well respected in the uh, national and international circles and until to October 2020 last year, Mr. Mollett was the DST Group's Head of Emerging Aircraft Structural Integrity. Laurie has received numerous Team Achievement Awards, most notably in 2010, Laurie was presented with the Minister's Award for Achievement in Defence Science and in 2016, he was made a member of the Order of Australia, AM. He is currently a consultant and trainer in aircraft structural integrity, air accident investigation and novel fatigue analysis methods. Today we are going to learn from Laurie, why can't you design a fail-proof aircraft like the indestructible black box recorder. I'll be moderating this talk and also doing the Q&A. Mr. Molland, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, virtual presentation. I hope you're all fine wherever you may be. My name is Laurie Molland and today we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, question I get quite often. Why can't you people, you engineers, design a fail-proof aircraft like the so-called indestructible black box? In other words, we're going to talk a little bit why, about why aircraft structures may fail. Uh, a little bit about myself, um, from background, an aeronautical engineer, uh, principal research scientist at uh, recently retired Defence Science and Technology Group, where I was head of structural integrity. Um, for your information, it's important to understand that I'm a aircraft accident investigator. I'm so-called tin kicker, so in other words, I'm interested in the airframe and the materials. I'm currently an aerospace consultant and I provide uh, accident investigation advice to the Australian Defence Force Safety Bureau. And that's myself uh, re actually recovering a black box flight recorder from an Illusion 76 that crashed in uh, Timor-Leste some many years ago, just to prove that. I was actually there. Right, the black box flight recorder, very famous uh, instrument. It was, uh, it was developed by Dave Warren, Dr. Dave Warren, from what was then the Aeronautical Research Laboratory. Um, long history behind it. When Dave first proposed the black box to uh, the Royal Australian Air Force, the uh, people in charge of the Air Force said, ah, we don't need that because all we're likely to hear is expletive. So no, we don't want that at all. So it took a very long time for Dave to um, get the black box data recorder uh, accepted. And eventually the UK picked it up and uh, the rest is history. They're now mandated on all, on all passenger aircraft. Uh, over here we see that's the original uh, black box. And yes, we know that it's orange, but it's called a black box. And here we have more modern versions uh, of the black box. The original had six uh, channels to record flight parameters, and one of those was a voice recording on a on a uh, wire uh, tape recorder type thing. A modern flight recorder would record up to two to two to six hundred flight parameters. The thing about the black box down recorder, it's fantastic. It's very useful to the accident investigator, but it tells you the what. It does not tell you the why. So very useful, but it's not, never the end of the story. Uh, just moving on, the purpose of today's uh, presentation is to deal with structural failure. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what us uh, uh, structures, materials type people look for 
in the sense that the question we're asking is, was the structure or materials a causal factor in the accident itself? Okay, so a little bit about what we investigators look for at a crash site, give you some familiarity with some of the structural terms and principles that we use, and that's going to help you in the future maybe to understand those so-called experts and what they're talking about. Now, firstly, this is not comprehensive. It's not going to make you an aircraft accident investigator. And more importantly, this is not intended to scare you in any way. Aviation is the most safest mode of transport by far. So I'm not intended to scare you, but things can go wrong sometimes. And I'm trying to explain to you why, and let's all learn and hopefully develop even a safer system. I'm gonna to touch on a few case studies to emphasize some of the things I'm gonna say. And I'm really gonna emphasize uh, metal fatigue because it's one of the most insidious forms of um, aircraft failure. So why do we investigate accidents and incidents for that matter of fact? It's all about learning from failure. We want to learn and fix the system. As I said earlier, I get asked, when people get over the shock that I'm not a point of sales consultant at Woolworths, I work out I'm an aerospace person, I go, hey, why can't you guys, you engineers, design an aircraft that can't fail? Well, the answer is very, very, very simple. It's got to get off the ground unlike bridges and other forms of engineering structures. An airplane has to be optimized to get off the ground. And in that sense, everything is traded off against weight, and believe it or not, safety. So performance is traded off against weight and safety. And that's why aircraft have a limited uh, design life, and sometimes things can go wrong. And we'll talk about those, I hope, today. Right, why? Okay. Firstly, let me tell you that the actual structures and materials factors in uh, aviation accidents contributing to about 10 to 15% of all accidents, okay? So why so much attention? Why so much research? Why so much uh, fuss? Simple, the people can uh, tolerate a human getting something wrong. So human factors, but they don't seem to uh, tolerate when a machine fails. The public demands the machine should always be in good shape, okay? And that's really important to the aviation industry because without confidence, without the general public being confident in flight, then there will be severe economical impacts and we don't want to experience any more of that. So that's the main thing, although structured materials only contribute a small fraction of total causal factors for aviation accidents, they gender much media and public attention. Oops, oops, there I go. So, what went wrong? Sometimes, many times, it can be very, very difficult to ascertain was the actual fault in the structural material. The uh, graphics I've got here are a crash site that was due to an F-111 uh, which impacted this area here, the crater. Just to give you some uh, feel of scale, what we're looking over here is a river. So that tends to give you some scale. And F-111 is the size of a 7767. It's a very, very large aircraft. Uh, and this particular accident, it was at uh, flying at 450 knots, very fast, at a very steep, at about 45 degrees nose down attitude. And that's the result. Most of the debris was spewed out of the, the crater. Um, and this is where I'm gonna get controversial from the start. We had an eyewitness and, well, at least in my view, <laughs> eyewitnesses are probably not the best thing I, I would look for in an investigation. This eyewitness happened to be a farmer and nothing against farmers, we all need farmers, but I don't think he had a degree in physics. So what he told the investigation team was, oh, I saw a fireball in the sky and then I heard a bang. Okay, so what he was implying was there was a mid-air explosion of our F-111. No, what physics would tell you was that the airplane hit the ground first, then there was a fireball, but light travels much faster than sound. So the first thing he was aware of was a fireball in the sky and later he heard the bang. Now because of his... Um, eyewitness testimony, it was up to the team to prove him wrong. And to do that, we had to reconstruct the aircraft. 
So over here on this photo, we see the reconstruction. And I think you can see that uh, not very many big bits of aircraft left there because when you hit the ground at 450 knots, this is a very typical. But nevertheless, we were able to examine every bit there and to uh, absolute categorical state, there was no evidence of in-flight fire or in-flight explosion. So in this case, the causal factor was put down to human factors. Ah, was the fault in the structures of material? Here's a case where just finding the structures of material uh, can prove to be very demanding. I'm not picking on F-111, but this is a, another F-111 crash in uh, Malaysia in an island called Paolo Ur in 1999. And that is the crater. It's still smoking. And this is a wing from an F the F-111. And these are investigators on the ground. Trust me, to get to this crash site was a um, very, very difficult uh, procedure. So it's essential that you find the wreckage and sometimes it can be very, very hard. Just on that note, if you don't find a piece of wreckage in the crater, boy, you need to start to look along the flight path until you find it, because that could be very, very important to determine the causal factor. Here's another pretty demanding uh, uh, crash investigation. In this case, an illusion, a Russian illusion 76 uh, aircraft uh, had, um, let me say, the pilots had push on itis. They were gonna complete this mission regardless of anything. Uh, very low cloud level, a few little issues with their maps. And the airplane uh, struck a series of trees back along this. The airplane became inverted. Uh, Paolo Ur or Timor is basically a uh, coral, coral based uh, land. So it uh, basically shred itself as it uh, went along this path here. Uh, basically, this is more or less like tinfoil and came to rest at the end of the path here. And just to add a woe to injury, the airframe then caught on fire. And fire is the investigator's worst nightmare because fire obliterates evidence and that's the last thing you want. We were fortunate in this case, I uh, showed you an early photo, to actually recover the flight data recorder from the rear of the, of the aircraft here. But um, just to give you scale, that's probably 500 meters. And we had to investigate every single little bit of pieces to ensure that nothing in the airframe or the serviceability uh, was causal to this accident. Okay, fortunately for us or for me, uh, aerospace engineers are fairly simplistic people. I've got a cutaway here of an airplane, it happens to be a Boeing 737, but the issue I wanted to uh, emphasize here is that every component on this aircraft or every other aircraft is principally designed to do one thing and one thing well. Uh, for, so for instance, on the wing, we have a, a, a beam, if you like, we call those wing spars, and the wing spars are designed to carry the aerodynamic loading that leads to the bending, and that's what they're designed to do. They're optimized to do that at the least possible weight to achieve the mission. Uh, bulkheads generally are there to give the airframe its circular oval shape. Uh, sometimes there are pressure carrying bulkheads like at the rear, but they're designed to do that one job and that one job well. So as an accident investigator, what I'm looking for is with some knowledge of what the airframe should do, I'm looking for the unusual failure in the crash site. So for instance, if I found uh, the airplane had crashed in the ground, I found that the spar was bent down, I'd be a little bit suspicious because I'd expect the crash to cause it to bend up and back. I'm looking for the unusual, okay. Does that make sense? I hope so. And fortunately, further, there are only a limited number of types of loading that, that can be produced to lead to, to damage. So there's, a, there's my airplane in flight. There, of course, is the lift, which is balanced by the weight. I've got a thrust load and I've got a drag load. And that's basically it. Now that, in terms of what that does to the structure, it can either put the structure in compression, you can put it in tension, as shown there. I can try to shear it. I can twist it or I can bend it. And that's basically it. There's no other forms of loading. 
So with the knowledge of what the structure should be doing, uh, should it be in compression, should it be in tension, I'm looking for when it is not the case at the crash scene. Okay. Right, the diagram I'm showing you here is what we call a finite element or a mathematical model of the structure. Once again, I'm not picking on the F111, but this is a part of the carry through or the wing sweep structure of the F111. My message to you here is that these days with modern computers, we're able to optimize the structure to try to achieve the minimum weight to do the job over a specific period of time. So whilst this may be a very complex structure, if I divide it into a number of what we call elements or little blocks, then mathematically I can solve what's going on in a little block as long as I know what loads are applied. So that's the little mathematical equation there, but don't let that uh, traumatize you. It's quite simple. Computers love solving simultaneous equations, and that's what final element analysis does, and it leads to a highly optimized structure. So this is the result down here of the uh, area here. And the red indicates a high stress level, high stress, stress, I hope you understand, is the product of the loading and the material properties. Uh, so when I see red, mm, I'm concerned because that's a high stress area and high stresses are part of the reasons sometimes why structures may fail. So here I have a high, and in fact, I can tell you right now that half my career was spent in addressing cracking from these two locations on the F111. It did crack there. But remember, the F111 <coughs> was designed before complicated or, or advanced computers, so we're not blaming anyone, because back then, if this was done by hand analysis, they did a pretty good job. One moment. Hmm. Lovely. So there's the mathematics that we use these days to highly optimize the structure. In other words, we're not carrying around unnecessary material, which adds to unnecessary weight. The airplane is optimized to do a particular job and to do it efficiently and effectively as humanly possible. Unlike, say, a bridge where you can tolerate additional weight or it really is a cost issue, not so much a safety issue. Right, the flight envelope is the first thing that um, you need to be aware of. Uh, aircraft is designed to operate within a particular flight envelope or, or performance uh, envelope, if you like. So what we show on this diagram, and we call it also a VN diagram, we have the load factor or G-forces, if you like, that the airplane is designed for uh, against uh, the aircraft, uh, the, uh, the airspeed that the airplane uh, can uh, achieve. And the, oh, oh, I've spoiled it for you there. The pertinent issue here is that us simple engineers were only tasked to investigate the structure's performance at the edges of the envelope, okay? That's all we were, trying, that's all we were tasked to do. That's all the certification requirements. So my, why I'm showing you this is, if you are a pilot, please stay within that envelope. Because if you fly outside that envelope, you're a test pilot. In fact, you're the first test pilot that's been out there. Don't do it, okay? So if you exceed the flight envelope and your wings fall off, well, I'm sorry. I was only tasked to investigate inside the envelope, not outside the envelope. So this is a maneuver diagram. A complementary diagram is the gust envelope. Now, very similar thing. We have the load factor, G forces, you know, 1G, 2G, 3G, against velocity, against typical gusts that <coughs> one may encounter in service. So once again, the inside of this envelope is the safe part, right? So you hopefully never, never experience a gust that uh, occurs outside the envelope, okay? The interesting thing here is that from a certification point of view, the gust envelope guy doesn't speak to the maneuver guy. They're in separate buildings, right? So why am I telling you this? So imagine, imagine you're operating at a high velocity and you encounter a 30 foot per a second gust and you are crazy enough to pull a 3G maneuver. They're cumulative. So all of a sudden you're experiencing 6G. Do not. 
be surprised if your wings and things start to depart the aircraft because the airplane was not designed for that. Thus, my lesson number one, don't go out the envelopes. There be dragons out there. You're not a test pilot. Not even a test pilot goes outside the envelope if that can be avoided. So I'm giving you some idea why sometimes operational reasons cause aircraft to fail. And no, nobody willingly goes in a gusty situation, but there may be cases where there is gusts and you unavoidably have to pull uh, many Gs. <coughs> Excuse me once more. <clears throat> okay, here's a, um, a, a diagram or a picture, if you like, of a certification test uh, of a seven Boeing 757. So the aircraft in this text, a test environment has been loaded to the maximum uh, expected loads in flight, factored by a safety factor to protect us engineers, just in case we got something wrong. And you'll see that the wings, oh, I can't even estimate, that's, that's meters of deflection there. But what I want to point out is that the airframe is buckling. It's buckling, but as long as we don't hear a bang, at, at the peak loads, this aircraft is said to be now certified, good to go, sell them, fly them. But what I want to point out is, if I was doing a certification test, I'd probably choose the best airframe, I'd probably have the best technicians work on it, okay? Make sure it's high quality. Secondly, where's, uh, what happens to an airplane as it ages? Oh, corrosion. Uh, mechanical repairs, incidental or accidental damage, none of that is represented in this uh, test. So there's no guarantee, <coughs> excuse me, that this test will cover you as the airplane ages or becomes uh, degraded by some form of um, uh, time-dependent uh, factors. Nevertheless, it's passed this test, it's good to go. Of course, there are numerous other tests. There are the flight test, the handling quality test, the fatigue test. So the airplane has to achieve a ticks in all those areas before it can be used to transport uh, human beings around. Rigorous, but there are always uh, limitations in the testing. And by the way, these tests are very, very expensive. So you can understand why a manufacturer may want to reduce the amount of testing done because they are very, very expensive and you've just uh, trashed one airframe. <coughs> Excuse me. Significant ways an airplane may fail operationally. We've sort of ultimate failure. I've just uh, spoken about that. You exceed the flight envelope, you overload the airplane, things may go wrong. You can also uh, degrade the airplane by excessive yielding, distortion, or even buckling of the airframe. And that may not lead to instantaneous failure, but may lead to things like uh, control surface jamming, uh, which leads to the airplane not being controllable. And that's, that's just as bad a problem. So excessive yielding, buckling, twisting, okay? You can overheat or fire damage the airplane. Now fire itself, as I've mentioned to you before, is very problematic, but even overheating is a problem because it may actually degrade the material properties and make them, uh, let's say, not as strong as what we, the designer, design the airplane for, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about flutter, uh, and flutter is an aerodynamic phenomena, aeroelastic phenomena, that's to do with velocity of the airplane and the stiffness of the airframe itself, okay? You can certainly degrade an airplane by uh, hitting it with a warhead, we'll talk a little bit about that, or uh, internal explosions, mm, to be frowned upon, not a good idea. We're gonna talk a lot more about fatigue, and fatigue's all about like uh, a long-term de degradation of the airframe due to repeated loadings, gas maneuver, landing loads over, over many years, can lead to cracking, and that could be very problematic. All these uh, factors 
are influenced by many, many other factors. So for instance, if you uh, have an aging airplane that has corrosion or mechanical damage, well, it's gonna fail a lot sooner than the pristine airplane for the same load, okay? Uh, and be, be aware that the weight and balance of the airplane will affect the, the operational envelope. And if you don't, if you overload or incorrectly balance the airplane, you may find yourself in a world of hurt. Firstly, the controls become ineffective. You may lead to flutter, not good. Again, very important that we maintain airplanes r rigorously because uh, let's be uh, serious, they're not as fault tolerant as say your motor car or your bridge or your ship. They're kind of like optimized to such a degree that um, these issues can become significant. Okay, let's talk a few, uh, few case studies now. Um, this is an Orion P3 aircraft. It's a submarine hunter, but this is going to extremes. Dipping in the lagoon is not a good idea. Let's not joke anymore. If you look very carefully at my ditched P3, a couple of things I wanna point out. Firstly, the propellers are gone. Well, they departed the airplane when it struck the water. Unfortunately, you see that red line there? Yeah. Yep, that's exactly where the propellers hit. That's why there's a hole there. Unfortunately, we had a, um, a crew member who was sitting there in the inside of the airplane and that was the one fatality in this case. More pertinent to my uh, investigation, if you look carefully, the leading edges, the brown bits at the front of the wing, are missing, okay? And I can tell you we recovered those back along the flight path. Uh, subsequent investigations revealed that the leading edges departed the airplane, rolled over and smacked the tailplane. In fact, one of them embedded in the tailplane, which made it even more challenging for the pilot to control. Not only that, it led to aerodynamic flutter to the degree that the environment in the cockpit was plus or minus 10 G. <laughs> Pretty severe. Fortunately, unfortunately, the airplane was flying like a brick, so it couldn't achieve, firstly, it couldn't come back to the runway, but it slowed down and the flutter stopped, which enabled the pilot to ditch the airplane safely. Long story short, we recovered the leading edges. Here's one leading edge, that's a section between the two engine cells, and that's what it looks like. And it immediately became clear that the ribs that gave it the shape, right, there's a rib, failed at the identical point along the span of that uh, leading edge. Wow, ah, that's a clue. <laughs> so the investigation was why did this happen? The other issue I can tell you is that we can determine that the airplane really didn't sustain um, a high sustained maneuver load that would explain why the leading edges may, may popped off. Long story short, the first discovery was that at the speed that the aircraft was doing and at the G-forces that the pilot exposed the airplane to, the airplane was experiencing about Mark 0.53, pretty good for a transport airplane. Um, and just so happened that this particular aerofoil at that condition experienced a transonic or a supersonic shock wave, and that increased the loads, okay? But <laughs> that wasn't sufficient to explain why the failure. The, after many, many years and much ridicule from our good friends, the manufacturer, what we determined was that as the air loads applied to this rib or the leading edge, uh, so imagine that the, it's being bent upwards, is that correct? The rib itself, if you look at it on the side view, the rib buckled. And as soon as the rib buckled, there goes its load bearing properties and that's why it failed. And the high stresses were along this uh, cord station and that's exactly where all the riblets uh, failed. Here's a case where Yes, there was a slight overload, wasn't excessive. Nevertheless, it did exceed the design envelope and buckling occurred, failure occurred, death occurred, not good. Okay, moving on. 
Corrosion, we'll talk a little bit about corrosion. <clears throat> a corrosion is basically, you're all familiar with a battery. It's the same principle. Um, there's many types of corrosion, but the conditions that are required for corrosion is you need a metal that will corrode. We call that the anode. You need a uh, conductive or cathodic material. You need the presence of some uh, conductive liquid or electrolyte and you need some sort of contact between them. So it's exactly the principle of how a battery works. Uh, environment, salt water, great electrolyte, which gives you the conductivity, okay? And what happens is that the uh, passive material gives off electrons, it loses material, okay? And corrosion, uh, that is basically what corrosion is. And sometimes the corrosion will pile up uh, and it would be problematic, but we'll talk why corrosion is a problem in a moment. But uh, you can really set up your uh, airplane to be problematic by say, oops, let me go back one, by choosing the wrong materials, for instance, and putting them in close contact. Here's our galvanic series down on the right hand uh, uh, side here. And if I was to put, say, magnesium alloy against titanium alloy, you could basically hear it sizzle away and corrode in, in your presence. So great care is taken to not uh, have uh, com comparable materials in close proximity, otherwise you will have yourself an unwanted battery situation. This diagram here is just to show you that it can really be problematic if you're not uh, detected and, and remedied. Uh, these, are, these are very severe cases of corrosion. Now what corrosion will do for you? It, because it eats away material, therefore you don't have as much material as the designer thought, so the airplane will not sustain the loads it was designed to because there's not sufficient material in its place. Uh, and also corrosion is a great uh, nucleation source for fatigue, and we'll talk more about fatigue. So corrosion leads to pitting, leads to all sorts of um, uh, sharp discontinuities, if you like, in the material. Great source of initiation, nucleation of fatigue cracks. So why we're so diligent about maintaining the condition of the airplane is to absolutely avoid these type of scenarios. And I can tell you there are many cases where cracking, etc or has occurred that led to serious incidents, or if this was a pressure bulkhead, the pressure bulkhead may fail, lead to decompression, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And moving on, we'll talk a little bit now about flutter, uh, aircraft flutter. Uh, many things will flutter, but aircraft in particular. It's basically a self-exciting oscillation, which occurs when there's sufficient energy put into the system that overcomes the natural damping that, that the structure normally experiences, right? Most things uh, uh, behave in this manner. You, you get a ruler or a beam and you hit it, it will vibrate, but it will dampen out. Now, if I put enough energy into the system, rather than damping out, the oscillations become divergent or they increase, and they increase at ever-increasing amplitude and the structure will fail, okay? Problematic flutter will occur if the excitation, and excitation can be due to the airstream or by uh, other pilot-induced manoeuvre, is at a similar fre frequency to the natural frequency of the structure. From an accident investigation point of view, flutter is kind of difficult to detect. Uh, this is a Jindavik that had uh, crashed due to flutter, and some of the evidence that we uh, saw was uh, what looks like crimpling of the fuselage, Oh, that's interesting. That's due to multiple cycles of something. Oh, that's strange. And the other thing was the um, lead mass balances on the control surfaces used to uh, trim the control surfaces. They were missing. Okay. Mm, hang on. Something of high oscillations occurred here to lead to this failure. Ah, flutter. And we're able to prove that. Okay, I'm going to try miraculously to give you, uh, to show you uh, an illustration of Flutter, and this is courtesy of our friends at NASA Dryson. Let's see. Okay, so here we have a, a model wing attached to an F-15, and the maniacs at NASA are flying it fast to investigate the, the Flutter. And you're clear to excel. In the slot, so It's flying pretty fast, Mach 0.8 there, and they're increasing the velocity. 
You can see the excitation in the airstream. It's starting to shake. That's just due to the natural excitation in the airstream. Uh oh. Hey, terminate, terminate. Terminate. Oh, Knock it off. Dear. We lost it. That was it. Flutter. We lost the okay. tip. So Flutter can be insidi insidious. You want to avoid it. Stay within the envelope. Look after your airplane. Make sure all this, there's no slack in control surfaces and you should be able to avoid flutter. Okay, Ooh, moving on. Okay, here's a, here's a case of uh, a helicopter uh, accident um, due to overheating. Lots of causal human factors involved here, but long story short, the, interme uh, the intermediate gearbox located there uh, was undergoing maintenance and there was a shift change. So, uh, so there was um, a couple of uh, drums of stuff on the floor. One of them was lubricating fluid. The other one was hydraulic fluid. And the new team thought, oh, this, must, this hydraulic fluid must go into this gearbox. Oh, and that's what they did. Mm, let's talk about quality assurance some other time. But that's what happened. And some 20 minutes into the flight, 28 minutes in fact, into the flight, the uh, gearbox overheated, overheated to such a thing that it actually mechanically welded together and that led to the uh, rotor going and without that rotor the helicopter auto-rotated into the ditch. It was recovered and fortunately no one was harmed. But that's just a case to show you that overheating, in this case, <laughs> to some a drastic effect can be really serious business. So you want to make sure that, A, you don't overheat the airplane. In this case, you want to make sure you put the right fluids in the right place. Okay, missile damage, which is uh, topical, I think. Uh, I'm just going to show you this uh, example where a warhead, there it is, there's your warhead nasty thing. That's where the explosives and the fragmentation stuff is in. Uh, it was exploded or detonated against an array in this case, lovely uh, old Mirage wings. Uh, that's a C-130, uh, well, whatever, uh, engine. This is the detonation sequence. And what we're seeing here is the warhead, the fragmentation device, in this case, metallic rods, expanding. And they're going to uh, soon impact my wing. And this is the damage done by that missile on my wing. Okay, go, oh, oh. These are other warheads, but this one led to the white damage that you can see here. And you go, oh, okay. Well, let me tell you straight off. A warhead is not intended to blow the structure out of the sky. It is intended to disrupt the system. And you can imagine if you have electronics and uh, fuel, this is gonna disrupt the system. But there's a weaker system in the airplane, and we'll talk about that next. That's just a lovely little sequence of uh, un the, this particular warhead detonating, okay? Uh huh, in a controlled, experimental, safe environment. OHNS is always important when you're doing experiments. Okay, here's another, here's another example uh, of a suspected warhead accident. This uh, occurred back in 1996 uh, uh, over the waters near New York City. Uh, once again, my favourite people, the eyewitnesses, were, were present. They were walking along the boulevard there and they looked into the starry sky and guess what? They saw a fireball. Ah! Then they heard a bang. They then speculated, aha, uh -huh, in-flight explosion, probably due to a missile, because we could see uh, some sort of a, a, a light tail, right? And because of those uh, expert witnesses, let's say, the uh, NSTB were forced to reconstruct the aircraft. There it is, re partially reconstructed, to show that no two holes lined up. In other words, couldn't have possibly been a missile because the missile would have gone through that thin skin fuselage. So at cost of many, many, many millions of dollars, the airplane was reconstructed. There was no two holes lining up. Missile could be discounted. By the way, there's no fragmenting uh, uh, warhead evidence there whatsoever. Hello. <laughs> so it definitely wasn't a warhead. 
the subsequent cause was subsequent the cause was identified. Let's leave that for some other day. But it was not a warhead, despite what the hundreds of expert eyewitnesses walking along the boulevard claimed that night. Ah, this is more topical and, and, and sad. This is uh, uh, more recently, uh, in fact, in 2014, uh, our friends in the Baltics decided to, well, we know now, launch a missile at what they, what they thought was a uh, military airplane. It turned out not to be a military airplane, but a uh, Malaysian, uh, what was it, an A330. It was flight MH17 and there was uh, lots of Australians on board. Uh, our good friends, the Dutch uh, Safety Board, did uh, the most of the investigation. But I can tell you that when I saw this on my TV set, I went, oh my goodness, a missile. Because look at this, look at this, look at this. A missile warhead was involved here. And wow, look at the cockpit area. There's definitely evidence of uh, an explosion. Remember I mentioned weak systems and a missile is designed to disrupt the system? Uh, can you answer rhetorically? What is the weakest system on an aircraft? Sorry? Human. The pilots? Yes, the pilots are the weakest system, the most fragile. So a warhead is designed to seek out, not the engine, but the cockpit and then detonate. And that's exactly what happened here. Fortunately for us investigators, it was uh, traced down to a system called the back, back 11, I think it is. That's what the warhead looks like. And sorry, that's what the missile looks like. That's the warhead. And fortunately, again, for us, the fragmentation device on this warhead uh, was uh, um, uh, 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 a prescribed steel tube that was scribed in this fashion. So when it detonated, these blocks of iron, steel, when flying, there you go, there you go, there you go. And why fortunate, it is the only missile warhead with this fragmenting device. So it was a signature and it was immediately we knew where to start asking questions, okay? So this is uh, typical missile damage. Okay, let's now move on a little bit because I'm running out of time. I'm having too much fun here. We'll talk about fatigue and damage tolerance. Aircraft are designed for durability for long terms in several ways. The traditional way is what's called a safe life approach where you uh, predict what loading over the many, many 30 years the airplane's going to experience and you design it such that it should be free of detectable cracks over that time period. So when an airplane reaches its safe life, you just dispose of it, okay? Yeah. The other traditional way of designing an airplane is what's called fail safe. That is, it's designed with a redundancy, such that if some part fails, there is another mirror item nearby that will carry that load. Mm. We'll go, come back to that in a minute. The more recent uh, design uh, philosophy is called the damage tolerant approach, where the designer just assumes from day one there are defects present of a prescribed size, prescribed by the authority, and these will not grow too critical in a prescribed period of time. And that may not be the lifetime, it may be let's say half the lifetime when we will go in and look for those uh, possible cracks, and if we do find them, repair them, and if we don't find them, we'll inspect sometime further in the future. This is where I want to tell you that an airplane is not designed to last forever. It is actually designed with a fixed probability of structural failure determined by these design methods that I just spoke to you about. Fear not, it's very, very safe. The probability of you losing an airframe is one in a million, one in a million flights. Not many airplanes achieve a million flights, okay? So sit comfortably in your chair with your cocktail. You're probably not on the million flight of that particular airframe, okay? But that is the fixed probability failure, okay? Not designed to last forever, to last a particular period of time. I'm gonna move on a little bit now. Uh, fatigue is really all influenced by how you fly the airplane. So this is a little schematic. 
you taxi, you climb, you do some maneuvering, you hit some gusts. And if you look closely, lots of, that's the G-forces, let's say the stresses over time. And each one of these loads above a certain threshold will lead to fatigue damage. Okay, so I think you understand the bigger these loads are, the more damaging. And by the way, the fatigue loads are generally way below the maximum static strength that the material will sustain. So whilst you can't break, pull it apart, if you keep bending it and fatiguing it, it will fail. And I'm sure you've all that experience with a piece of wire. That's fatigue. Oops, I'm rushing too far there. Okay, so that's the basic principles. Uh, how big the loads are, uh, what was the mean value, 1G, 2G, whatever. Uh, and importantly, the number of cycles. So the designer, hello, estimates what this will be over 30 years and then designs it to do this one job for 30 years. You change the way you do this job and your airplane fails at half the life, you're the test pilot, my friend, because we designers didn't want you to do that. We want you to fly this. Did I say we estimated it? Oh yeah, we did. How good a job did we do? Well, you judge for yourself. Okay, this is a micrograph of a fatigue fracture surface. That is 10 microns, 10 divided by a thousand millimeters, okay? And that's the loading that was applied. And I'm gonna draw your attention to the bigger loads. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's a repeated pattern on this surface, trust me. And let me get it right here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So there is evidence flight data recording on the fracture surface of the loads. And that's really a critical sometimes when we're investigating fatigue related accidents, be able to correlate markings on the surface to load history. Okay, there you go. Okay, here's a case study for you. Um, this is a SPA, remember I mentioned SPARs, designed to carry the bending loads. This uh, failure occurred in 1990 of a Mackie jet trainer. Okay, this is the recovered uh, spar boom, this little bit here. Yes, you're right. That does look like fatigue. You are absolutely correct. And you'll notice the fatigue goes all the way back to, what the, what is this? That's meant to be a well-manufactured hole, but what's this? Uh, long story short, the artisan who created this hole pierce the back face, leaving a very sharp flute, very sharp flute, very high loads. Fatigue says, thank you, I want that. It nucleated and grew quite rapidly to failure in something of the order of maybe 50% of what the design life of that spa was. Did I mention two people dead due to what we call let's call it um, inadvertent poor quality, okay? Aircraft are very sensitive to inadvertent poor quality. Moving on. Okay, fatigue tests. Uh, we are asked to demonstrate sometimes the durability of the airframe doing testing. Um, certain manufacturers were highly reluctant to do fatigue testing. This uh, because it's very, very expensive. Um, however, uh, after certain accidents uh, uh, of uh, the 737 and 747, the FAA mandated the Boeing go back and do fatigue testing of the 747, which had been in service for 20 years. To ensure that we knew all the potential areas of uh, potential fatigue cracking, and yes, lots of new areas were discovered and the fleet was modified before it got to the state where we lost a cargo door or a section of fuselage and et cetera, et cetera. Very important, just want to emphasize that not all airplanes have been fatigue tested. Unbelievable, yes. We uh, ex-military types uh, are really keen on fatigue testing, uh, particularly although that Australia buys its airplanes from overseas. We tend to use them differently, like for instance, the F-18 Hornet. 
is uh, meant to be a carrier-based aeroplane. We use it as a land-based. We have our train area very close to where we, where we lived with the aeroplanes. So we realized quite early that the manufacturer's lifetime was probably not going to be applicable to the Royal Australian Air Force. And we embarked on a full-scale fatigue test. There's a F-18 buried in there. There's the uh, engine uh, exhaust outlets. And there's an airframe buried in there. And this whole rig system was designed to simulate the f flight loads that the airplane was likely to experience. Akin to you uh, Hollywood fans, no highway in the sky some 50, 60 years earlier. You can see the rig back there. It looks a lot like that rig there, but that's <laughs> just an aside. <laughs> so what is this fatigue thing? Uh, if I get this video, this is a section of an FA-18 and it's under cyclic loading. It's, it's flying in a test rig, if you like. I want you guys to bear particular attention to this little hole down here. Okay, can you see it? Oh, you're nodding. Oh, very good. Okay, let me try to make the movie work. Make the movie work, Laurie. Make the movie work. All right, movie is running now. Keep your eye here. What's going on there? This is a very, very, oh. That is a, a fatigue failure. And I hope you appreciate that if that occurred in flight, that would be catastrophic, okay? just to give you a feel of what these things look like. Okay? Boop. No, no, oh, one more time. Make sure you look at that little hole. Oh, is it running? Yes, it's running. Yes, it's running. Okay, you see the bushing fly out? Oh, yes, excellent. All right, let me try to stop this and move on. Yes. Fatigue failure, the most classic failure. Uh, fatigue failure curb. The first commercial pressurised airplane, the Comet, British de Havilland Comet, back in 1954, where two airplanes were lost. Very long story. Why did this occur? Uh, yes, it was the first pressurised airplane. That gives you a hint. The uh, subsequent investigations showed that, in fact, it wasn't the windows per se, but the little windows used by the navigator up here that suffered from fatigue. And it was subsequently shown that, oh dear, the stresses due to the sharp edge here uh, were very high, much higher than was anticipated. Number one, high stresses. Number two, it just so happened that during the manufacture of the riveting process, and it was used, what were they called, a um, punch riveting process, that one of the punched drilled rivets tore or produced crack-like features exactly coherent or co-located with the high stresses and that led to the fatigue failure of more or less two aircraft with the loss of 100 lives okay and this occurred very early only after uh, 900 flights uh, and in another case 1200 flights where the design life was meant to be 4,000 flights. Okay, high stresses, somebody got it wrong. Does that sound like the Mackie? It does sound like the Mackie failure, doesn't it? Yeah. F-111, moving on. First F-111 flew off in uh, 1969. Uh, this particular beastie here uh, failed at 104 hours out of a design life of 4,000 hours. Why, why you ask? Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. It was a manufacturing floor. There's the manufacturing floor. It's about 25 millimeters in the most highly loaded uh, part of the airplane. And I showed you the final model of that earlier. This little progression mark there is the fatigue growth. So that's, that represents 100 hours of growing a crack, right? The pilot pulled, I think it was four, five G. The wings came off, they could not, um, uh, they did not survive. It caused a mammoth uh, change in how we design airplanes. The use have abandoned the safe life process to the damage tolerance process. And to recover the fleet of uh, F-111, they were periodically put in a chamber. There is the chamber. And cooled down to minus 40 degrees. And then maximum loads were applied. 
excellent. If it didn't fail in there, which many did, uh, it was safe to fly for another 2,000 hours, went back into the box. Expensive, but the only way to ensure safety. Yes, the RAF lost several. I just want to illustrate, this is the toughest steel in the world. Unfortunately, it's probably the lowest fracture toughest steel in the world. So that's where the failure originated. There's a zoomed in area. You can see, I hope now, that you're fatigue experts. Progression marks. And you see the initial nucleating floor? Yeah. Yeah. You know what that was? You do? Oh, yes, it was a corrosion pit. So this particular failure, nucleated from a corrosion pit, and within 2,000 hours was serious enough to cause complete failure of that wing section. That's fatigue. That's why we care about it. That's why we want to avoid it. High stresses, there's a discontinuity of the floor. A low, uh, uh, this accident, incident occurred in 1988, where a uh, four meter section of the uh, fuselage departed uh, at maximum pressure loads. Maximum pressure loads at maximum altitude. Ah, okay, long story short, I might do this justice, but what happened in this case was the uh, fuselage uh, is made up of m m uh, several panels, very large panels, and the panels are fastened together to join. And in this case, the critical uh, areas were meant to not be bonded using an adhesive, then riveted. Ha! Huh. Poor choice of adhesive. The adhesive gave up the ghost in this Hawaiian tropical uh, environment, leading to fatigue from the fasteners the fatigue nucleated because the fastener heads were countersunk to produce a very sharp knife edge. And these are the highly loaded areas of the fuselage, yeah. Oh, manufacturing defect coupled with high stresses killed a few people, yes, yes. And caused the aviation industry to go into virtual meltdown because this phenomena was kind of a new phenomena. We won't dwell on it. High stresses and a manufacturing defect. Hmm. Whoa. Hmm. What's this? Ah, yes, Qantas. Yes, they're not immune to uh, such failures. This uh, occurred uh, 2010. Uh, VHQQA, an Airbus A380. Uh, and you probably saw some uh, media on this, and it was quite dramatic. Uh, this is the damage that happened when the uh, gas uh, turbine turbine departed the aircraft. That is, yes, a hole through the wing, not good. This is the trajectory of the debris. So you can see it's gone through the wing, but missed the tailplane. Can you imagine if these arrows were a little bit down, what a different outcome this would have been for the 469 people on board this uh, aircraft. Why did this happen? I hear you say. Okay, oh, it was fatigue, but this time, not of the turbine disc itself, there's the recovered turbine disc, huge thing, oh, that scale, that's 15 centimetres, that little thing there, very big. What actually occurred was that the lubricating nipple, or what we call an oil stub pipe, here we are, was mismanufactured. As you can see, the boring process to put a hole where the oil should go led to this big score mark in here. Is that a manufacturing? Yes, it is a manufacturing defect. Oh. Manufacturing defect, large stresses, failure occurred. Uh, could have been catastrophic for everyone. Moving on, there are many, many, many discontinuities that can lead to fatigue. Some of them come out of the factory uh, with the airplanes. These include surface finishes like uh, chemical etching to clean the material. Uh, what have I got here? The material itself has uh, hard particles that are close to the surface and the machining, the grinding will break them and then they become very, very efficient crack starters. And I mentioned our good old friend corrosion that could nucleate things. I'm going to move along a little bit here. Uh, yep, as I mentioned before, very briefly, 
We use damage tolerance these days. We go in and examine the airplane at a particular uh, point in time, and we're trying to find cracks. Is it, is it the um, most efficient? Well, I'll leave you to answer that question. It's just you need to know well, that's how we manage safety, uh, airframe safety these days highly reliant on the ability of the human being, the inspector, to find the cracks. And it's us, our role as engineers, to try to point the inspector to where to look. Where do you look? Oh, where the stresses are high. Oh, yeah, yeah, good, good, all right? It makes some sense, all right? We'll move on a little bit here. What I've got here is just to give you a feel about what fatigue is and what it does. So what I've got here is some test data. I've taken samples of, let's say, Water material, in this case it's an aluminium alloy, and I've put fatigue loads to simulate a Hornet flight, flying, at four different maximum load cases. So each of these colours are the maximum stresses, uh, about 430 megapascals down to about 320 megapascals. Okay, so the uh, little, oh, oh, I'm spoiling it for you, the little blocks you see here represent uh, 300 hours of operational or, or test usage. And wow, yeah, okay, I'm looking at the data and I'm sort of, yeah, okay, they all fail. The high stresses fail first, yeah, yeah, yeah. But hang on a second. The mid-range and this, they fail at the same time over here. What's going on? I'm really confused. And by the way, this is my best uh, prediction using commercially available software. And you go, oh. Oh, yeah, but have a look at this. May have predicted this one, but my airplane fell out of the sky here. So I wasn't particularly happy with this uh, series of test results. So one of the eureka moments that uh, myself and my team made was to replot this. Notice this is linear, one, two, three, four. And this is linear along the scale. Well, the magic happened when we converted the scale to a logarithmic or exponential, if you like. So that's point, 001 mil, 0 0.01, 0 0.11, one, 10 millimeters. Pretty straightforward, right? Exponential. Hang on a second. Wow, they're a straight line now. Well, that's pretty important because even mathematically inept people like me might be able to model a straight line. But let's have a look at it again. Oh, look at the green. Yep, higher the stresses, the faster the crack, the shorter the life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lower the stresses, longer the life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hang, why is there scatter? Why is there difference between the time it fails? Oh, let's trace it back to, oh, look at that. The initiating discontinuity varies. So the one that failed first, let's, right, had the biggest initial defect size. Hello, defects are really important in fatigue. Oh, okay. Um, I don't want to get too complicated, but we can explain why this one has such a long life it actually nucleated subsurface. And when it nucleates subsurface, it takes some time to broach the surface. When it does, all bets are off. Okay, so that's really what I wanted you to sort of learn a little about why some traditional people, wow, fatigue is really complex, highly variable. People like myself and Professor Jones, we're getting a much better understanding. Oh, the initial discontinuity is really important. If we can characterize that, we can probably predict a straight line. Okay. Ah, oh, so we're almost at the end. I'm sorry if I went over time a little bit. I got a little bit enthusiastic. Let me leave you with this. Aviation is absolutely safe. It has an incredibly low probability of failure. Very, very low. Our good friend, the black box data recorder is very, very, very useful, but it won't tell you everything and boots on the ground, the investigator on the ground, looking at parts, examining parts, is still a critical part of aircraft as investigation. Aircraft have to get off the ground and they have to be economic to use. So we trade off everything against performance and that includes safety. Why? Well, how? By mandating a specific but limited probability of failure, okay? Now things may go wrong, and sometimes they do, unfortunately, they still do. And I hope I've given you some idea why. Maybe due to poor design, too high stresses in the area. Maybe maintenance or production quality deficiencies, accidental damage, oh, overload, explosion, etc., etc. When we look at our friend fatigue, 
I think I've hope convinced you that you need two things simultaneously. High stresses and a discontinuity in the same location, okay? So unfortunately, fatigue cracking still occurs, but hopefully our damage tolerance inspector will find the crack before it becomes critical. But mind you, they weren't looking at the oil stub and it failed at 100 hours and yeah. So it's not infallible, but we're doing our very, 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 very best. So I wanna leave you by thanking you for your time and attention. Please fly safe and um, send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think we have a couple of questions. Professor Jones, please. Uh, yeah. Shall I come and stand there so you can Sure, oh, you can, yeah, sure. You can, you can sit beside me. I've got, a very, I've got a few very simple questions. Uh, only a few. Well, I'm fairly simple as I explained to you. And you talked about the black box and it being orange. Ah, true. Why is it called Ah, uh, if you're an electrical engineer, right, and you have an instrument, you know that something goes, you have the, something that goes in and a response comes out the other side, and in between you have this uh, instrument. Well, that's a black box. All I know is something goes in and something comes out. So traditionally, instruments were called black boxes. And unfortunately, the flight data recorder was called a black box, despite the fact that it's been orange, fluorescent. Why? So you can f help find it. If it was black, a month's burnt soot, it'd be very, very hard to find. Does that make sense? Yep. No, no, the last, on slide 11, you said they'd been working on these holes in the F-111. Uh, <laughs> for the most of your life. Most uh, of my life, yes. <laughs> did they ever, I mean, they were high stress concentrators. Did they cause an airplane wing to fail? Uh, only in cold proof low test. So if you recall, maybe you don't, we lost several, four, five aircraft. But then um, a team led by, let me recall, Professor Reese Jones. Uh, and company developed two things, a reinforcement for the outside of the wing, and we reprofiled those cutouts that I showed you to lower the stresses, and there was never another incident of in-service or cold-proof failures subsequent to those modifications. Uh, look, um, you mentioned Jimmy. Um, wasn't that an early Australian drone? Can you repeat that one more you time? Jindavik. Uh, Jindavik. Was that an early I should have lauded Jindavik. Australia has invented many, 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 many things. Black Boss Flight Recorder, the pipeless drone, the Jindavik. The Jindavik was the first, first jet pilotless drone, and it's still or was one of our best export um, uh, items ever. So it was exported to many NATO countries and served with distinction, at least until the missile hit it, for many, 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 many years. Yes, you're correct. And it was world beating, and Australian you, world beating. You, you've talked about corrosion, you've talked about stress. Does, uh, does stress change the rate of corrosion? Does stress change? There are, there are types of corrosion that are stress related, like stress corrosion cracking, of course, um, but whether, I mean, high stress, if you have a corrosion pit, the higher the stress, the quicker the crack will grow. So yes, stress, stress is number one. And that's why we designers, structural designers, we're really stress people, okay? Uh, you talked about the failure of the Mackie. The Mackie, sad day, is that. that the, is that specific failure the one that led to the scrapping of the fleet? Yes, that uh, failure led, as I indicated, uh, subsequent investigations determined that the, this type of damage would halve the life of the fleet. Most aeroplanes were beyond half-life. So there was an inspection program uh, initiated, but it was very, 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 very difficult to get into that area to inspect. And we also knew there was other holes that had similar build quality. So the eventual decision was to replace the wings. So, but that took two, three years to get new wings. And during that time, the uh, repeated inspection at a very um, short inspection interval, from memory, f every 50 hours, I think, was the only way that the Air Force, sorry, Air Force, could maintain proficiency, i.e. train their pilots. Otherwise, no pilots. My last question, towards the end of your talk, you mentioned Hornet. Is that sort of a European bird? Or? The Hornet is the FA-18 fighter attack aircraft that has been proudly used by the Royal Australian Air Force and many other 
air forces in the world, including the second biggest air force in the world, United States Navy. <laughs> and uh, it's um, near its retirement life in Australia. We uh, managed to operate its its life through uh, understand fatigue by over 10 years, which was a proud achievement for Australia. But it's, uh, it's seen its day and it will be replaced, or is being replaced right now, by the mighty F-35. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I hope you, uh, everybody, got something out of this presentation. Once again, don't be scared. Fly safe.